Today we're gonna to look at two interesting examples that give some motivation for why the dimension is not really a good measurement of the size of a set. And by the size of a set, I mean like the number of elements in a set. So maybe we'll just like briefly say dimension does not equal cardinality, although that's clearly an oversimplification. Like I said, we're going to do this with two examples. So we will show that the cardinality of n cross n is the same thing as the cardinality of n, where by n I mean the natural numbers or the positive integers. So I'm using this notation with an equal sign and an underscore c to mean equal in cardinality or equinumerous. We'll also show that r cross r is equal in cardinality to r. And this really drives home this idea up here because I think we could all agree that the real plane r2 or r cross r is two-dimensional whereas the real line r is only one-dimensional, yet they are equal in cardinality. And we'll show two sets are equal in cardinality or, or, or equinumerous using the following factor. Really, it's a definition. So we say that two sets A and B are equinumerous or equal in cardinality if there is a bijection, we'll call it F from A to B. So in this first case, we'll construct an explicit bijection. So let's get to that. So let's define a function f from n cross n to n by the following rule. So notice the input needs to be a pair of natural numbers. So that means we need two things to be inputted in here, f of m, n. And we need the output to be just a natural number. So perhaps we'll take this to be something like 2 to the power m minus 1 times 2n minus 1. And we'll see how this works. Okay, so let's recall that a function is bijective if and only if it's both injective, in other words, one to one, and surjective, in other words, onto. So let's first show that this thing is injective. So we will suppose that f of a, b is the same thing as f of c, d. So this is always the first step for injectivity. You suppose that a function evaluated at some element of the domain is equal to a function evaluated at another element of the domain, and then you should end up with those elements of the domain are the same. Okay, and then maybe we'll go ahead and do this as well. So without loss of generality, let's also suppose that C is bigger than or equal to A. So if we just think about the numbers A and C, which are both natural numbers, well, clearly one has to be bigger than or equal to the other, so we might as well choose our naming convention so that C is bigger than or equal to A. Okay, so now let's unpack this fact that F of A, B equals F of C, D. So that means we'll have 2 to the a minus 1 times 2b minus 1, that's f of ab, equals 2 to the c minus 1 times 2d minus 1. That's f of cd. Okay, but now from here we'll just multiply both sides by 1 over 2 to the a minus 1, or in other words we will divide by 2 to the a minus 1. So let's say that's what this arrow is. So we're multiplying, like I said, by 1 over 2 to the a minus 1, which is totally allowed if we work inside of the rational numbers. But as we'll see, this in fact keeps us inside the natural numbers. So over here on the left-hand side, we'll be left with 2b minus 1. And then on the right-hand side, we'll be left with 2 to the c minus a times 2d minus 1. And now we're going to make a very important observation, and that is that 2b minus 1 is odd. But since 2b minus 1 is odd, and we have the product of two numbers on the right-hand side, each of those numbers has to be odd. We'll notice 2d minus 1 is already odd, so what that really tells us is that 2 to the c minus a is odd. 
But the only power of two that's odd is the zeroth power of two, which is equal to one. So that means two to the C minus A is equal to one, but in turn, that means that C minus A is equal to zero, which means that A is equal to C. Okay, so that's good. We've got our first thing. We have that A is equal to C. But now let's put that back into maybe this equation right here. So looping that into this equation gives us the following. We will have 2b minus 1 equals 2d minus 1. But now it's fairly straightforward to solve or maybe reduce that and see that we immediately get b equals d. You know, like by adding 1 to both sides and then dividing by 2 if you wish. Okay, so let's put a box around that as well. But now if we put those two green boxes together, we see that the ordered pair AB is equal to the ordered pair CD, which is exactly where we needed to end up for this thing to be injective. So just to reiterate, starting here and ending here means our function is injective. So that finishes this part of the proof. Okay, so now let's move on to showing that this, this thing is also surjective. In other words, it's onto. So if it's injective and surjective, then it is bijective. Okay, so let's maybe take some number. Well, maybe we'll call it something like A, which is a natural number. And then let's use the fundamental theorem of arithmetic to factor this into primes. So we'll have a is equal to 2 to the r1 times p2 to the r2 all the way up to pk to the rk. Where I've written 2 as its own prime, remember there's only one even prime, so I'm going to write that on its own. And that's motivated by the shape of f here. Okay, so what do we have? Well, there's, like I said, only one even prime, so that means that all of these are odd primes, but since all of these are odd primes, this whole thing is odd. But since this whole thing is odd, it can be written in the form 2 times n minus 1. And so if you want like an explicit version of n, we can get that fairly easily. Maybe we could write n as p2 to the r2 multiplied up to pk to the rk plus 1 over 2. So again, we've got a product of odd primes plus 1 is even divided by 2 is still a natural number. So that would be our n in this case. And then 2 times n minus 1 is that yellow boxed thing over there. But then notice right here we've got our power of 2. And so that really motivates the pre-image for this natural number A. And we can maybe just finish this off with the following observation. That if we take F evaluated at, let's see what it would be. Um, R1 plus 1 comma N, we'll see that that is definitely equal to A, given that it just builds this equation right here. Okay, so we have injectivity and surjectivity, which means we have bijectivity. But if we have bijectivity, that means we have equal cardinality. So that means we've proven this statement right here. So now let's move on to this second statement. And here we're going to use a really important result from set theory called the cantor schroeder bernstein theorem. And if you'd like to know more about this theorem, I actually proved it in a video on my second channel. Oh, did you know I had a second channel? Well, on that channel, we devote everything to learning mathematics. In fact, I have full courses in number theory and differential equations, and also intro to proof writing, and this one is in the intro to proof writing course. Um, also, I'm building one in abstract algebra at the moment, and there will be more to come. And what's the best thing about this channel? Well, it's ad-free. And it's ad-free because of all of my great supporters on Patreon. And if you'd like to help me keep that channel ad-free, then maybe sign up for the Patreon, of course, if you are able to. Okay, so now back into this example. So the cantor schroeder bernstein theorem says that if we have two injective maps, one from A to B, 
and another one from B to A, then in fact we have a bijection from A to B, or in other words, A and B are equinumerous or equal in cardinality. So using this theorem, all we really need is to find two injective maps. One injective map will go from R to R cross R, and then we'll need another injective map from R cross R into R. Okay, so let's maybe label each of these with a name. Let's maybe, let's say this one is F and this one is G. And now let's work up each of these individually starting with this function f, and this one is very easy to define. So let's define f by f evaluated at x equals the ordered pair x comma zero. And that's really all there is to it. That's clearly an injective function, so we have an injection from r to r cross r, and we're good to go there. Now, defining G will be a little trickier. So how are we gonna do that? Well, we're gonna start off with the following fact. And this fact says that R is equinumerous with the interval zero to one. And if you'd like a function that does that, then we could easily define that as H of X equals one half plus one over pi times the arctan of x. So there are a bunch of functions that do this, but this is one of them. I think this is maybe my favorite just because it allows us to kind of review what the inverse tangent function does. So this gives us a graph that's something like this. So it's asymptotic to the horizontal axis or the x-axis, or in other words, y equals zero to the left, and then it's asymptotic to uh, y equals one to the right. And so that clearly defines as a bijection. Okay, good. And so using this fact, all we really need is some sort of bijection that goes from zero one cross zero one into zero one. And then after this, we can compose both sides of this with functions built out of H, and then we're good to go. Okay, so how are we going to approach this? Well, we'll use a decimal expansion for every element between zero and one. So let's take xy in zero one cross zero one. So that's a little bit awkward, but we read this as an ordered pair, and we read those two as open intervals. So maybe let's point out over here that I mean that x and y are both between zero and one, not including zero and not including one. And now what we'll do is we will write x as zero point, maybe x1, x2, x3, x4, so on and so forth. So something like this. Or we could also maybe write it as the sum as n goes from one to infinity of xn over 10 to the n. And the important thing here is that all of those xi's are between zero and nine. So they make up digits here. And then another thing that's important to take here is that these do not end in all trailing nines. And that's because any decimal can either end in all trailing nines or you can increase the previous digit by one. Well, let's maybe note that here, just so to see that we have a choice. Notice that 0 0.12999, so on and so forth repeating, is in fact the same thing as 0 0.13. And so what we'll do here is take this expression, this 0 0.13 expression, when it's possible. So in other words, do not take trailing nines. Okay, and then we'll take y written similarly. So this will be 0 0.y1, y2, uh, so on and so forth. We could rewrite this as a sum as well. The sum is n goes from one to infinity of y sub n over 10 to the n. And here the yi's also come from the set zero to nine. So they're digits. 
And again, we'll impose that same rule of no trailing nines here. Okay, and then maybe we'll call this function g, even though we kind of use g for this up here, maybe we'll write this as g hat. And g hat is really the composition of g with something like this function h on either end, which we won't end up doing carefully. Okay, so now let's define g of x, y to be the following number with its decimal expansion. It will be 0.x1, y1, x2, y2, x3, y3, so on and so forth. So if we wanted to, we could rewrite this as the sum as n goes from 1 up to infinity of... Let's see, the odd terms are the x's and the even terms are the y's. So we could write this as xn over 10 to the 2n minus 1 plus yn over 10 to the 2n. And I think that'll do it. And now proving injectivity follows immediately from the uniqueness of this decimal expansion given that we've made this choice over here. So maybe I'll leave it as a little bit of a homework exercise to fill in those details if you'd like. Okay, so that aforementioned video where I prove the cantor schroeder bernstein theorem should be on the screen right now if you'd like to check it out. And that's a good place to stop. Thanks for watching and sticking around until the end of the video. And since you're here, don't forget to gently press that like button. Subscribe, ring the bell, and select all notifications to never miss a video. If you want to get your name in the credits like you see here, access the live seminar series, review videos before release, and more, go to patreon.com slash michaelpenmath and become a Patreon member today. If you want full ad-free course content, subscribe to my second channel, Math Major. I've got courses on linear algebra, complex analysis, and proof writing, among several others. And that's everything. Bye.